Hey, Mike here. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Dark Poutine early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. You're about to listen to a historical episode of Dark Poutine. After episode 149, you will find Scott is no longer with the show. In an effort to maintain continuity and offer listeners as many episodes as possible, we are leaving the episodes in which he co-hosted intact. Thank you. Welcome to Dark Poutine. I'm Mike Brown, creator and host. With me as usual is my good friend and co-host, Scott Hemingway. Say hello, Scott. How do you find ladies and gentlemen? Fine ladies and gentlemen. And gentlemen. Yeah, I'm being, I'm trying to be more regal in this episode. Regal? Yeah. Pip, pip. Tell ho. Oh, you're, you're a Brit. Ladies and gentlemen. Is that because uh, there's another British baby? Do you follow the royals at all? N- no, but I, I have been made aware <clears throat> thanks to tv of this uh, birth the televisal yeah yeah i mean yeah uh just shave your head william all right let's get to it dark poutine is not for the faint of heart or squeamish as our content contains mature themes harsh language and graphic descriptions of violent crimes listener discretion is strongly advised we're not journalists or experts on any of the topics we present. We're just two regular Canadians who are interested in the dark side of Canada and Canadian history. Yeah, irregular Canadians even. Regular. Put on your toque. Grab yourself a double-double and an Nanaimo bar. It's time to scarf down some dark poutine. Welcome to episode 24 of Dark Poutine. It's springtime outside. It was warm here today. Holy crap. We got up to 29 according to my car. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was fantastic. That is very, very warm. Windows down. 29 Celsius for for you folks. I think sometimes Americans think we're Fahrenheit up here. It's probably how we get the reputation of being all like, oh, Canada is just all ice. It's probably because of that. The Maybe conversion. it could be. Because we're like, oh, it's 29. How great up here. And they're like, wait, isn't that like below freezing? Yeah. I, I just figured we just solved that. Yeah, exactly. Wow. Okay. Then we can end this podcast here. Yeah, we've, we've, uh, we've, we've made the change. We've the world's problems. We've made the change we set out to do. Yep, exactly. Um, yeah, but what is one thing you really like on a, on a warm summer day? What do you like to do? What do I like to do? Yeah, what if you had to have a, have your choice of drink or anything like that? Would it? Uh... Oh, I'm pretty I'm pretty uh, generic in that sense. I would love just the beach and a uh, root beer. A root beer. Yeah. What about a milkshake? Oh God, yeah, they bring all the boys to the yard. Yeah, where where do you where do you usually get your favorite milkshake here? In... Oh, well, there's actually a really good. Uh, I can't remember the name of it, but a really good uh, malt shop. I actually have a. Or a soda shop in Vancouver. Oh, Burns, uh, the the one on on uh, Hastings. Hastings. Yeah, in, yeah, in they yeah. get great milkshakes there. But you know, I love uh, White Spots milkshakes. So. White Spots milkshakes actually play an interesting part. Well, in this podcast. Well, today. well, specifically vanilla White Spot milkshakes. Yeah, nope, not a vanilla guy. Not a vanilla guy. It's just it's it's plain man you just you just don't dig it or i mean i i mean i i'm okay with vanilla ice cream vanilla anything but it's not i i have never in my life been like i i choose vanilla it was always like oh so at somebody's house they got vanilla yeah you know it's uh it's just it's plain man it's plain let's let's mix it up a bit mix it up a little bit let's live let's, let's, let's throw live. some strawberries in there i kind of like uh just plain old vanilla yep that makes sense up yours. <laughs> All right. Yeah, so it's a bit of a weird one this week. It brings us right back home here to Vancouver uh, in the mid-1960s. Uh, as uh, the strange crime was committed by a local radio personality, uh, the subsequent arrest and trial were big news here. And this guy's name was Rene Castellani. And we are calling him the milkshake murderer. Oh, Interesting. And I got that from a book called Dead Ends BC Crime Stories by Paul Wilcox. 
Rene worked uh, for CKNW in 1965. Um, after years of struggling financially, he finally uh, sort of hit the job that he really, really dug, which was being a, a promo man for mm. CKNW, which was kind of the big radio station of the day. Yeah, uh, yeah. Sixties. Well, even it lasted until like right ra until radio started to swing down. But right. it was like it was the premier news uh, station. I, I I used to listen to it constantly. Yeah, exactly. Well, it's it still is a talk radio station yep. here, yep. but uh, it doesn't have the cachet that it used to. Radio doesn't. Radio does not. <laughs> It's now more more for podcasting. Let's be podcasters, Scott. That's what I'm talking about. I think we're being them. We are. Woohoo! Isn't that funny? Yeah. So yeah, you can still hear CKNW at 980 on the AM dial. The I've Lord always man. wanted to say that. Like I always wanted to be in radio when I was a kid. And so, hey, you can hear CKNW at 980 on the AM dial. You would have made a killing back in the day. Do you think? I'm telling you. I yeah. I don't know. Yeah. No, you would have made a killing. Yeah, well, I tried to get a job at the radio station in my hometown, uh, just being like a, a schmo around there, just, you know, picking up junk and stuff like that around there. But uh, they didn't want me. Jerks. Yeah. I now know. look I at know. you. Yeah. Now look at me. Soon to be unemployed. Soon to be unemployed. Only two more <laughs> two more days. When this podcast releases, I will be unemployed. Oh, sweet, glorious, glorious unemployment. Unemployment. Yes. Yeah, so back to our story. Sure. Uh, Rene Castellani was well known for his crazy stunts. He would wear like a a, gr a gorilla outfit mm -hmm. and things like that. Um, he did all kinds of things like that to draw attention to CKNW and their their advertisers. Oh, okay. He played many on-air pranks that earned him the nickname The Dizzy Dialer. Oh, jeebs. The Dizzy Dialer. <laughs> One of his more memorable capers was trying to convince listeners that a wealthy Middle Eastern Maharaja was attempting to buy all of British Columbia. Yeah, okay. Sounds fun. Yeah. And so uh, Eve Lazarus wrote a little bit about it on her website. Uh, Castellani went so far as to take out ads on busboards. He stayed at the Western Bay Shore, dressed as an Indian prince, and rode around in limousines with bodyguards and an entourage of dancing girls. That sounds fun. I'm sold. Uh, so effective was the campaign that outraged locals, uh, also known as racists, made up <laughs> signs uh, shouting, keep BC British. Oh, geez. What pieces of garbage. Uh. I mean, it's somewhat to be expected in the 60s, but Hashtag still. Hashtag white folks. Still balls. Oh, yeah. Uh, Rene Emile Castellani married Esther on July 16th, 1946. The couple lived with their 12-year-old daughter, Janine, in a duplex at 2092 West 42nd Avenue in 1965. And this is in Vancouver's Carisdale neighborhood. Very nice area. Very affluent. Yeah, it's it's it was it wasn't as affluent at the time. Uh, it was just a regular middle class neighborhood at the mm -hmm. time. But now to actually purchase a home there, you're looking at three to four million dollars. Yeah, a couple of beans, which in Vancouver isn't ridiculous. Yeah, so it's a shack essentially that's yeah. ready to fall down yeah. that you have to pay a million dollars for. Exactly. Esther was the manager of a children's clothing store, and she really enjoyed her work. And by all accounts, they were a relatively happy couple. That is, until early in 1965, the phone rang one night, very uh -oh. late. A woman's voice asked Esther, do you know your husband is going around with someone else? Dun, dun, dun. Yeah. And when Esther wanted to know more, the woman hung up. Esther didn't tell Renee about the phone call, but she did, some, she did become su suspicious. The mystery caller had obviously put a bug in her ear. Yeah, well, that'll happen. Yeah. You know, you'll get a, you know, somebody calls to say, hey, your husband's doing this. You're going to kind of, well, a little head scratcher there. So Esther began snooping around in Renee's pockets uh, when he was out of the room, and she found a love note in his wallet signed Lolly. Oh. Lollipop or Lolly oh. Gag? Or both. Yep, could be. Lolly, it turns out, was the nickname of a recently widowed single mother of a six year old son. Her name was Adelaide Ann Miller. Miller was a receptionist at CKNW. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, she and Renee had actually begun seeing each other in the fall of 1964. Oh. It was obvious to co-workers that they were seeing each other. Uh, they were very affectionate at work. <laughs> they all knew what Castellani was up to with the much younger Ms. Miller. Mm -hmm. 
the caller might have been a jealous co-worker or even Miller herself trying to cause a breakup so she and she could have Renee all to herself. Yeah, you sense. never know. Makes sense. Esther confronted Renee and he denied being unfaithful to her. Yeah. Yeah. It was right around this time that Esther began feeling unwell. Oh, uh oh. Yeah. Esther began suffering racking pain from stomach aches and horrific back pain. Oh, somebody got the Ebola. Uh, maybe. Nausea and diarrhea were Esther's constant unwelcome guests. Mm. She began experiencing weakness and tingling in her limbs to go along with the vomiting and excruciating pain. Sounds rough. It does sound very yeah. rough. She could barely lift a book to read and was missing lots of work. Mm. Esther struggled to keep any food down. Thank goodness Renee was bringing her yummy white spot milkshakes with him on the way home from work every day. Oh, well, they are good. Well, they are really good. And yeah. if you're feeling sick, like yeah. a white spot milkshake would probably hit the spot. Yeah, yeah. Those milkshakes were one of the only foods that Esther could manage at the time. Esther was worried. Renee claimed he was too. Hmm. Esther started going to doctors who were baffled by her condition, admitting her to hospital on several occasions. She was tested for everything from cancer, thyroid problems, odd infections, and gallbladder issues. Nothing. They couldn't find a thing. Mm. They couldn't figure out what was wrong with her. In May of 1965, Lolly Miller was ousted by CKNW. Oh. The affair that she and Renee were having had become too much of a distraction in the station, and Lolly was the problem, so out she went. Yeah, classic 60s move. Right, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Renee got to stay and carry on his role, of uh, course, because he's a man. Of course. Yep. Yeah. And I wrote here, if you're wondering why her and not him, uh, you might want to check out the TV show Mad Men for a bit of insight into the office world of the 60s. It's, exactly. Especially regarding gender equality in the yeah. workplace. Yep, just give her a slap on the ass and send her on her way. That's right. It's so sad. God, I hate that. I hate misogyny. Her being fired uh, did not cool the affair, uh, and Esther continued to get sicker. In June of 1965, Renee undertook another memorable stunt for CKNW. This time he partnered with Bowl McLean, or Bomac, a car dealership on oh, West yes. Broadway. I, I, yeah, I, I remember that one. Yeah, well, we're going to get into that in a big way. The sales manager at the time was none other than Jim Pattison, yeah. Yeah. a man who would one day become BC's richest man worth over $5 billion. Yeah. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about he, Jimmy later. He can actually afford a house in Vancouver. Yes, he can. Yeah. Uh, a number of them. Yeah. He can afford a building if he wants. Whoa. And he, I think he owns a few. He does. The Bomac car dealership uh, was well known for its huge sign. Yep. It still stands there today as a heritage site as long as Toys R Us, the current tenant at 1154 West Broadway, remains. Quick story about that sign. Yep. Uh, what my dad used to live near there, and that's actually how I knew when I was a kid to, to, to pull the buzzer on the or the bell on the bus at when I would see the Bomac sign. Oh, that's good. Yeah, so it was always that indicator. Oh, this is where I get off. Right, because you couldn't determine a, an address. It was like the 70s. I was like eight. That's no excuse. <laughs> It's true. From Vancouver's Heritage Society's Flickr photo of the sign, the Bomac sign was constructed in 1958 on West Broadway, which was Vancouver's auto row at the time. A number of car dealers, notably Duick and Dealey dealerships, had begun erecting a number of increasingly large signs to attract attention. The Bomac dealership countered with a 29 meter or 80 foot high orange sign illuminated with red, neon, and hundreds of flashing light bulbs. The background was repainted to the current red and blue colors. Yes, it was quite uh, it was quite noticeable. Very much so. Castellani's idea was to live and broadcast from a car high atop the sign until every single vehicle on the Bomac lot was sold. <laughs> Esther Castellani was in the hospital just blocks away in Vancouver Hospital when Rene took to his perch high above the city on the Bomac sign. That would have been a weird sight to see some dude sitting up there. What year? What year was this? 1965. Oh, okay. I don't remember then. I was no, going to say, I wonder if I jumped past. But, yeah. The promo was a success. It took eight days and all the cars in the lot had been sold. Hmm. So Renee hmm. could come down. <laughs> he returned to his daily milkshake deliveries to Esther, who was obviously fading, 
and all her doctors, including internal medicine specialist Dr. Moscovich, still had no idea what was ailing her. Medical staff noted that Renee seemed impatient when talking to them about Esther, who was obviously dying. Hmm. He asked how long it would take before she was gone. It's not sounding overly empathetic. Well, his strange questions were shrugged off as those of a husband who didn't want to watch his wife suffering any longer. Yeah, okay. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Obviously, later on, we find it wasn't that. Yeah. From a New York Daily News article, when his mother-in-law asked Castellani if he had theories about Esther's failing health, he replied, <laughs> I can't believe he said this, but this is what they say he said, when a house burns down, I don't look for a fire, I look around to build a new one. Oh, whoa, what a dick. <laughs> right? <laughs> Jeez. So your wife is sick in the hospital. It's just, hey, it's time to look for a new one. Yeah, yeah, that house is on fire. I'm just going to walk away from it. Yeah. I... Holy guacamole. What a dildo. I guess. Oh, man. Yep. And that's what he was up to. Uh, Renee was not so secretly building a new life with Lolly Miller. <sighs> On July 11th, 1965, Esther Castellani died. Five days before her wedding anniversary with Renee, it would have been their 19th. Oh, shit. Renee arrived at the hospital that day, vanilla milkshake in hand. And he was apparently wearing his uh, gorilla outfit. Really? Yep. <sighs> When he was told of Esther's death, he immediately went to the washroom and dumped the milkshake into the toilet. He flushed twice. Huh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I guess we don't need this milkshake then. Yeah. Like, what? Like, it's, it was the 60s. What did he think they were going to, like, I don't think they had, like, technology to immediately, ah, oh, let's look into this milkshake to see if this is. Well, they did. Really? but not right away. Yeah. An autopsy was performed the next day. The medical examiner attributed the death to heart failure and a viral infection of unknown origin. Huh. On July 14th, a funeral was held for Esther Castellani. She and her casket were put into a concrete crypt at the Forest Lawn Memorial Park in Burnaby. Hmm. So she's not buried. She's just in a crypt. Yes, that's the one. Uh, I believe that's... Uh... The one in the, the cemetery in off Royal Oak, I believe. It could be. I, had a, like, I don't know for sure. I think you might be right. Yeah, it's the one on the hill there. Yeah, I've attended a funeral there. Uh, only two days after Esther's burial, the radio station paid for an impromptu vacation to Disneyland for Renee and his daughter Janine. That's nice. Mm -hmm. Renee took Lolly and her son along too. Yeah. Um, like give it some time, maybe. Yeah. No? Like, Jesus. Two days. Two days is long enough. <sighs> I mean, she's gone. I mean, what are you going to do? Well, your house is burning down. Build a new one. That's right. On July 28th, while his wife was in her crypt only two weeks, Lolly and Renee went house shopping and applied for a mortgage for a new home. Holy shit. It's not suspicious at all. Oh. The fact that Esther, a relatively healthy 40-year-old, had passed away from organ failure haunted Dr. Bernard Moscovich. Yeah. He was their internist that I mentioned yeah, before. Yeah. The autopsy results didn't seem to match what he had seen. Mm -hmm. He decided he would have some samples of Esther's tissues tested for anomalies. Perhaps she'd ingested something. It would take a few weeks for the results, but he had to know if he'd missed something. Moscovich's suspicions were realized. He was horrified by the results of the toxicology tests. Esther's tissues had huge amounts of arsenic in them, hundreds of times the expected levels. Hmm. Apparently the 60s had better technology than I had assumed. Well, yeah. That's a terrible amount of arsenic. <laughs> it is. It was like 1,500 times I read it Jeez. once. Jeez. Moscovich took his findings to police immediately. On August 3rd, after a search warrant had been obtained, Esther's body was exhumed and another, more thorough autopsy was performed. Sure enough, the evidence was there indicating that the organ failure had been due to arsenic poisoning. Mm -hmm. At the same time, police issued a search warrant at Rene Castellani's home. There, they found an almost empty can of Triox Ortho, 
a liquid weed killer under the sink in the kitchen, and this was taken into evidence. Hmm. More tissue samples were taken, and samples of Esther's hair were sent off for analysis by forensic scientist Norm Erickson in Toronto. Hmm. They used the hair to determine when Esther had been poisoned. Interestingly, the portion of hair matching the 10 days that Renee was atop the Bomax sign showed little signs of the poison. <laughs> <laughs> wow, you don't say. I wonder, I wonder what was going yeah, on. That, that doesn't link anything. No. It also showed that the poisoning had resumed after Renee's return. What a coincidence. The science pointed to the triox orthos that cops had found under the sink. Hmm. In spring of 1966, Renee and Lolly were planning on getting married. The cops and Crown prosecutors had other plans. Uh -huh. Good. Renee was arrested and charged with the first degree murder of his wife, Esther. At the time, this was a capital offense in Canada, punishable by hanging. Hmm. Wow. Yeah, 1965. I don't, yeah. Uh, even in the light of all the evidence, Rene pled not guilty and the case went to trial. He maintained his uh, innocence all the way through. Yes, yeah, not, not the first uh, killer to ever do that. Nope. The trial began on 26th of September, 1967 and got a lot of local attention. You can imagine. Yeah. Uh, the evidence was pretty salacious and a fair arsenic poisoning via milkshakes. And a celebrity of the time. Yeah, exactly. A radio celebrity. Yeah. Esther's physician, Dr. Moscovich, said he missed arsenic poisoning, as did all the other medical experts who saw Esther in her illness. Moscovich said the possibility of arsenic never occurred to us at all. Mm -hmm. Well, why would it really? Yeah. Mrs. Castellani had been subjected to more than 125 tests, but none of them would have turned up arsenic poisoning. Hmm. Poor woman. Yeah, what, it's a hell of a lot of suffering to go through. Absolutely. Cruel bastard. Yeah. There were at least 47 prosecution witnesses, according to an interview given by Renee's defense attorney. They included expert witnesses, some of whom were flown in from Los Angeles, Toronto, and in two instances from the UK, mm, wow. all to talk about the science used to prove Mrs. Castellani had been murdered, how she'd been killed, and that her unfaithful husband, Rene, had been the one who'd done it. Mm -hmm. Rene stuck to his guns, testifying briefly. When asked outright, had he killed his wife, he, by his lawyer, yeah. he looked directly at the jury and spoke one word, no. Yeah, the jury didn't believe him. <laughs> they, they felt the prosecution had proved the case beyond a reasonable doubt. Rene Emile Castellani was found guilty of the crime of first-degree murder of his wife, Esther. Good. Bam. Rene was sentenced to death, and his execution date was set to January 23rd, 1968. Hmm. Yeah, I, I get so uh, used to the fact that we don't have a capital punishment that, it, that I forget that we had it at a time. Well, guess what? Two months later, on November 30th, 1967, Bill C-168 was passed. This created a five-year moratorium on the use of the death penalty, except for murders of police and corrections officers, and this was done by Prime Minister Lester B. Pearson's liberal government. Mm -hmm. okay. Lester. Okay. And I don't know why they called him Mike, which is interesting. Yeah, no idea. I think Rene Castellani must have had a horseshoe up his ass. No kidding. Uh, his death sentence was commuted to life. Uh, to be served at the New Westminster Pen uh, in BC, also known as Ocala. Uh, I grew up next to the, uh, well, after when I was 10, uh, in the, where I lived, we grew up, it was like two blocks from the pen, but it was shut down and we used to go play in it. Oh, great. Yeah. Uh, we'll dedicate uh, an episode to that in the future. There's, yeah. There's some really interesting stories about the BC Pen it, that I've, I've found. There are. Rene Castellani was paroled after only serving 12 years of his life sentence in 1979. What? Right? So you're sentenced what? to death, then it's commuted to life, and then you get out 12 years I don't years understand later. that. Like, if you're sentenced to death, like, they're willing to put you, they're willing to kill you. Yeah. The government's willing to kill you. Yep. But, like, so at no point should they be like, eh, you know what, actually, let's just let him go hang. Let's just let him go. Yeah, not actually hang, like I meant like hang out, yeah. Yeah, hang out, yeah, yeah. not like hang by Because that would be death. Yeah. Huh, wow. Wow, okay. Yep. 12, 12 years. <laughs> exactly. Both he and Lolly had gone their separate ways. Uh, they each ended up marrying different people. Hmm. 
Renee Castellani didn't stay out for long because on January 4th, 1982, he died of cancer. Well, at least there's karma. I guess so. Uh, I couldn't find any real information about the Castellani's daughter, Janine. Only a few anecdotes stating that she grew up to be a kind and compassionate mother of two. And she was hurt by what her family had gone through all those years ago. Essentially, she lost both parents. Yeah. Uh, like the poor girl. I, yeah. What, what a challenge to have to overcome in life. Absolutely. If you're looking for a smoking gun, I can absolutely guarantee you, you will not find it. In October 2001, a series of letters filled with a deadly powder called anthrax were dropped into the U.S. mail system. What started as an unprecedented case turned into an unsettling mystery. Who sent these deadly letters and why? From Campside Media and Sony Music Entertainment, I'm Josh Dean, and this is Cover Up Season 4, The Anthrax Threat, available now. I mentioned uh, billionaire Jimmy Pattison earlier, and yeah. here's another example of what a small world it is. So. Uh, again, a connection to the crime. Uh, the 90-year-old tiny billionaire <laughs> known for his flashy sports coats, he's about like 5'2". Oh, I've, yeah, I've, I've yeah. seen him once. Yeah. Uh, he still works five days a week, coming in early every morning and riding the elevator with employees of a local telecom, pleasantly chatting them up as they go. I've been one of those. I have too, and yeah. I, that's what I'm saying. Uh, up until the day this podcast is being published, uh, I was working for that company. Yep. So uh, I would ride the elevator often with Mr. Pattison. We had a lot of really interesting conversations. Yeah, it's quite amazing for uh, a man of his age and his wealth. You would think at some point you'd be like, I'm good. Let me just ride out my, you know, the remaining years. But no, man, the guy still, still goes. He's, yep. he's an impressive individual. Yeah, he's still working. Yeah. And he remembers your name too. If you tell him once, he will remember. <laughs> your name and he will call you by your name the next time he sees you yeah he, i told him my name was susan oh yeah well good for you yeah i've chatted with him many times as i've said uh, but after learning about this case i wanted to talk to him about it because i'm sure he would remember it yeah because if he's good with names yep i'm sure he's even better oh. with names of murderers especially like selling all the cars on his lot yeah and he's the sales manager yeah. i'm sure he would very well remember that totally however i chickened out <laughs> <laughs> i would i think i would have too yeah because you don't know how he's going to re respond to it yeah and and if you have to be employed in the building and and the billionaire in the building hates your guts you're probably not going like there anymore he assaulted by an 85 year old yeah <laughs> Although, you know, like there's some money to be made there. But. He doesn't look very hitty though. No, no, he doesn't. He's he, uh, everything I've seen of him. He's a, he's a good man. Apparent. Well, he, he's, uh, apparently not going to leave his wealth to his children. Interesting. Who's he going to leave it to a cat? I don't know, but he, he doesn't, he, he thinks they need to earn their own money. You know, I, I've heard, I've heard a lot of stories like that and I, I quite respect that. Uh, if I was his kid, I'd probably not respect yeah, it. Yeah, chintzy old bugger. Yeah, but I, I can, I can absolutely respect where he's coming from, so. Yeah, sure. But yeah, if I was his kid, I'd be right pissed. <laughs> really it, pissed. It's really, it's probably just like his way though, to prevent his kids from murdering him. Cause like, if you know, if I kill dad, billions. Yeah, fair enough. And then suddenly it's like, if I kill that, well, I get nothing. People will kill somebody over a crack rock. So. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, billions. It's a pretty good strip. Good job, Billy. Jimmy. Yeah, Jimmy. Jimmy. Or Billy Madison, I'll call him. Whoever that is. He thinks I'm Susan. He's probably his brother. <laughs> the Bomax sign where Renee spent those eight days is still there. Uh, the Toys R Us logo has been kind of slapped over the Bomax sign. It looks friggin' hideous. Yeah, there, it was quite a contentious topic at the time that was happening because the Bomax sign is a heritage piece, mm -hmm. and so uh, yeah, they there was a lot of a lot of hate towards Toys R Us for one because they, they wanted to just take it down. Yeah, but they were told no, and so they just yeah Jerry rigged a Toys yeah. R Us sign. It really looks bad. <laughs> yeah. You can Google it, just uh, Google Vancouver BOMAC, B-O-W-M-A-C sign, and you can see uh, all the story about it. It's just like, oh my God, it yeah. just looks awful. Yeah. And it's still, it's like 80 feet high. <laughs> but what happens with Toys R Us now but that they're going? Well, guess what? What? Toys R Us is floundering and the lease on the property is up uh, June of this year. Yeah. And if the city doesn't try to save the sign again, 
it most likely will be demolished when a new developer gets their paws on it. You know what they'll probably do though is they, like the, what they did with like the Woodward sign. They'll save the sign but take it. it down. Either move it or if like some you know I don't think they can build high rises or anything in that location because of the view. Uh, but um, whatever, maybe something they do is constructed there, just like in the Woodward's building where they put the the W at the roof. Maybe something similar to that. Yeah, I walked by the W the other day. They have it. Uh, the they have a replica W on the roof, oh. and the actual real W is down on the ground. You can actually walk up and oh, touch I it. Oh, I didn't know. Oh, yeah, I yeah. didn't know it was a replica down. Yep, or up there. Huh. Yep. I don't know how I feel. Uh, about it would be uh, expensive to refurbish the Bomax sign and bring it back to its former glory. So I don't think that's going to happen. Mm. And the property is worth forty-two million dollars. Holy, that it sits on. Jeez, it makes sense knowing the the location, the area. Yeah, so there's wow. less of a chance of a savior swooping in to save the day. But yeah. it was Jimmy Pattison's sign, right? And he's a billionaire. But if he was willing to, you know, uh, if it was almost going to be taken down uh, twenty-five years ago or whenever the Toys R Us was put there, yeah. then uh, you know. Why, why now would he step up to save it? But uh, it'll be interesting to see. I have a feeling we will be saying goodbye to that sign. Do you? I think it'll be kept somewhere. You think? Even, even if not like refurbished or something, they'll auction it off. Maybe put it in Stanley Park. Yeah. Or they'll auction it like off. right on the end of the park. And some private private owner will have it in storage somewhere. That's a lot to store. Well, yeah, if you're buying a, like a... 60 foot sign i'm assuming 80. 80 foot sign i'm assuming you got some loot and somewhere to store it i think i would have better things to do than buy a <laughs> 80 foot stupid bomax sign <laughs> well so would i like i'd have another mclaren maybe oh god yeah yeah oh sexy mclaren yeah i don't know if that's gonna happen no uh next week i'm off to crime con in nashville tennessee <laughs> so I'm going to get to meet a lot of cool people. I'm especially looking forward to meeting some of the other, other podcasters in person. Yeah. And we have some cool stuff planned. There's a meetup happening on Friday night and another one, I think, on Saturday. Uh, so there's going to be lots of meetups. But, That's awesome. Uh, as well as going to uh, to learn about things. I think one of the main topics that everybody is going to be talking about at mm -hmm. Crime Gone this year mm -hmm. is uh, the East Area Rapist and original Night Stalker. Oh, is this some new thing? The Golden State uh, Killer who that... was uh, captured today. Oh, that's, I haven't heard anything about that. Joseph D'Angelo, yes. We have heard everything about it. <laughs> yes, we have. And so we're, we'll talk a bit more about that on our after show, but oh, I'm yes. pretty certain that's going to be a, a topic that everybody is talking about there. Absolutely. So I have uh, a bit, I'm working, we're working on a bit of a surprise that's going to happen there too. <clears throat> uh, two other podcast hosts have asked me to participate in a show with them mm. yeah so i don't know I, i'm not going to tell you what it's going to be about but it will make sense when you hear it because it will definitely uh fit the dark poutine oh i'm ideas. excited i have no idea either so i'm excited i'll tell you off the damn right you off the mic for sure You're damn right but uh, i don't want to spoil it for the other guys so i don't because i don't know what they have planned for sure oh it's exciting it sounds exciting yep so stay tuned for that um I was a little nervous last week when a naked man wearing only a green jacket and an assault rifle entered the Waffle House in Nashville and killed four patrons who were eating waffles at the time. Yeah, I could see why you'd, that you'd be a bit concerned. Yeah, uh, he was still on the run Monday when yeah. uh, the shooter, 29-year-old Travis Rainking, was taken into custody. Yep. And he, he looked, uh, I saw a picture of him in the back of the police car. He looked rather worse for wear. I didn't see the police car photo. Yeah, he looked like he'd been thumped about. Oh, wow. He probably fell down. He, I'm sure he did. Yeah, yeah, maybe. Multiple times. Maybe bonked his head on a branch or two. It could have been yeah. a number of things. I'm sure. Yeah. Well, he's being held without bond, uh, so I think it should be okay if I want to go eat waffles. So without, without James Bond? He's being held without James Bond? So... Why would Do I they have to explain Bond? To why, you? why? Why would they? Eat, it's what? Bale Scott. Oh, 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 James Bale. Like a bale of hay. What? That's even weirder. You're not well. It's even weirder. I've never been anywhere in the U.S. that far south, other than Florida, but uh, that doesn't count because when we went there, it was full of snowbirds and 
Yeah. That's what people call Canadians who travel south yeah. for the winter. Yeah. We have shipbirds and we have snowbirds. Yes, exactly. Uh, so if anybody knows what, what to do in, in Nashville other than country music, uh, please let me know. Uh, I'm sure there's lots of good things to eat there. I'm, I'm pretty certain I'll be having fried foods. Oh God, yes. And, uh, so I might need two first class plane tickets. <laughs> for back, coming back. Yeah. For coming back. Yeah. Yeah. For the size of me butt. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Oh, I'm jealous though. Should be some good food. I think it will be definitely. So, oh, I posted this afternoon uh, for anybody who is not a, a Patreon patron already. Um, I posted the entire press conference of the East Area Rapist stuff there today. So you don't even have to pay us to get it. I just recorded the whole press conference and I put it up there for anybody who missed it. Sweet. Yeah. So it's kind of I cool. didn't see it all. I watched a chunk of it, but not all of it. Yeah. Uh, we have a bunch of new Patreon patrons. I think they felt sorry for us because last week I said it's, I guess we suck because only Gary Smith pledged to us. Well, let's do that again then. So oh, only one. We're terrible. Only one. Actually, we no, lost. That would be we a lie. Lost. That, that would know. be a huge lie. I know. So this week. Uh, a lie for profit. Kate Platt. Oh. Pledged to us. As hey, well, Carrie. Kate. Kate and Carrie. Thank you. The C's. And uh, Vinny Krieger. What a great name. That is a really wicked name. Vinny Krieger. Yeah. It's like, I'm Italian and I'm German. Yeah. It's not, yeah, it's way cooler than Scott Hemingway. Much. Yeah. Uh, Cassandra Case. Oh, hey, Cassandra. Thanks, Cassandra. Thank you. Uh, Joe Balineski, who uh, we've interacted with on social media a few times. Thanks, Joe. Uh, Veronica Moreno, who is also a member of the Yumber Yard. And hilarious. Uh, yes. And much so. hilarious. Hilarious. So thank you, Veronica. And Rhiannon Foley. That's another great name. Or Foley. Sorry. Foley. Even, like as in Mick Foley. Still even fan Mankind. Fantastic. Name. Are you related to Mankind? If you are, I would like to talk to him. I, I think in like, in, in every way, we're all related to Mankind. Get it? Oh, I got it. Yeah, mankind. Yeah. Yeah. I'm hilarious. Sometimes, sometimes I, I struggle. Mm, no, I don't. Yes, yeah, so thank you very much to all our new Patreon patrons. Mm -hmm. You folks rock, and you sometimes perhaps even roll. I'm sure that they there's a lot of rocking and or rolling. And or rolling. If you want to donate to us... Uh, yourself and you don't do so already you can at patreon.com slash dark poutine or you can send us some donut money via paypal at our email address dark poutine podcast at gmail.com so or just send us donuts or donuts i'd rather not get donuts in the mail frankly Pfft, stickler well there's a krispy kreme right up the street this is true and those when the hot light is on those are amazing donuts. yeah, yeah. yeah. Or Timmy's. Yeah. Sure. We're, we go to Timmy's a lot, though. Yeah. Check out our website, www.darkpoutine.com, for show notes and other cool stuff. Uh, I'll have lots of links to uh, things from today. Yep. And you can even look at White Spot and see how much a, a White Spot milkshake is. Uh, and, and they really are good. I'm sure that they no longer contain arsenic. I don't think they ever contained arsenic f directly from the white spot. They had to do with uh, with Mr. Rene Castellani. Okay. Well, putting the poison. They're delicious the and he's dead. Or so he won't be able to put it in your milkshake. Exactly. So go get them. They're really good. It, actually, if you want to see the one of the milkshake cups that he used and the Triox Ortho, it's in the police museum. Oh, sweet. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. They, they have a display in the police museum. Oh, that's here really in cool. <laughs> yep. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Just search for Dark Poutine and tell your friends. Somebody said I should pronounce poutine like a Maritimer. And I'm thinking, which brand of Maritimer? Is it like the Newfoundland, like Pout Dark Poutine? Okay. Dark Poutine. Well, that sounds right to me. Or I could go the Lunenburg County way. Oh. oh. Which is where I'm from. Yeah, well then do and that. And it would be Dark Poutine. I got got some of that day, huh? And the dark pushy. Sounds very really, uh like it's like Cajun, Louisiana. Well, it is kind of. Yeah, Acadians are from 
Cajuns are Acadians from Ooh. Nova Scotia. Wait a minute. Did here. you know this? I did not know this. Well, how about them apples? Wow. Yep. So that's how it works. The reality I knew is no longer. Now shattered. It's shattered. You're welcome. Wow. Scott's going to have to go contemplate his life. Everything. Uh, also fun is our Facebook group, as we mentioned, the Yumber Yard. Uh, come there, uh, answer some simple questions like, what's my name? What's Mike's name? What's Scott's name? Shh, and don't are, give it away. Are you a good egg? Or a bad apple? And, and there's no wrong answers, to tell you the truth. I'd like to see some creative answers. So, uh, there, was, so I. there was that one that it was like, what's, what are the host's names? And, and, the, and the person said, Scott Hemingway and the guy who picks on him every week. <laughs> <laughs> but this is how we like it. Right. You wouldn't know what to do if I didn't harass you. I sure feel good about myself. Well, I can't let that happen. Yeah, don't let it happen. Uh, you can subscribe to us on your favorite podcast directory like iTunes, Podcast, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spotify, and at our host, Podbean. Uh, we're still getting those iTunes reviews, and uh, that asshole from Florida has left that two-star review there for me to fume at. Yeah, well, you, some, somebody's got to. We need some, you need yeah. something to fume at. I guess we had to have one troll. Yeah. So there we go. Uh, stay tuned for the uh, after show where we will be talking a little bit about Toronto and what happened there in the past week. And a whole lot a bit about. And a whole lot about uh, the Golden State Killer. That's right. Wow. Ear ons. Exactly. So don't forget to be a good egg and not a bad apple. That's right. Toodaloo, everybody. Loodle twos. said to my parents, don't trust her. I wouldn't listen. Every family has a secret. Joy Delaney, mother of four, has gone missing. From the author of Big Little Lies comes a chilling new mystery to W. You were an emotional chaos sinkhole, Amy, and I'm sick of it! Starring Annette Bening. Nobody can break your heart like your own children. And Sam Neill. She will come back. Here we go. Strap in. Apples never fall. All new Thursdays, only on W. Stream on Stack TV.